Hi team. In this video, we're talking about projecting the balance sheet in an LBO model. But first, I want to talk about the wild impact working capital has on a business. Have you ever asked yourself why we have accounts payable at all, or accounts receivable for that matter? The entire system, our economy, relies on trusting that a third party will pay you. You give someone a product or service and just hope to hear back from them. And this happens on a scale that would absolutely dwarf the actual banking system. By some estimates, Less than 10% of commercial credit is actually financed by a bank loan, and is bizarrely not really tracked with the same rigor. Now, to stay on top of accounting rules, I find it helps to read about fraud, because it's still accounting, but someone's losing millions or billions of dollars, and that just helps me keep the pages turning. In his book, Lying for Money, How Legendary Frauds Reveal the Workings of the World, author Dan Davies explains that, in almost every industry, there is some general recognition of the fact that trade customers need to make and sell their product before they have cash to pay for their inputs, and that their suppliers are often in a better position to provide credit to bridge this gap than the financial system is. He breaks it down perfectly to include three reasons suppliers regularly provide credit. The first is convenience. If the alternative to making a sale on credit is letting the goods hang around until the customer can raise the cash, there is a savings to be made by getting them moved out of your warehouse and into the customers. So consider a supplier's willingness to accommodate a sale on credit for a perishable item like wild-caught salmon. You want to get that fish into the hands of someone that can turn it into cash as quickly as possible. Next, you have increased sales. If a supplier is willing to extend terms, then the supplier's potential customer base expands to include entities that might be temporarily short of cash, but still able to pay on a reasonable time horizon. And finally, you have perceived credit risk. When a bank makes a loan to a company, the use of cash is uncertain. They can do anything with it. But when a supplier provides inputs, say, mini fillets of salmon, on credit, the purpose of the loan is known, and the objective is to sell that salmon to anything that wants to eat it and collect payment. That said, the payment part is important. If you're extending terms, choose your business partners wisely. Consequently, a supplier is likely to perceive less credit risk. At the conclusion of this explanation, Davies offers an insight that I found fantastically appropriate for working capital analysis commentary. You can tell more about the structure of any industry by looking at patterns of payment terms than you can from any five forces or SWOT analysis. What I love about this quote is the emphasis it places on analysis of accounts receivable and accounts payable to determine not only the health of a company's balance sheet, but also the health of an entire industry. Now, the purpose of this introduction is to encourage you to think through how working capital decisions impact cash flow. As an analyst, you should always be comparing a company's working capital balances to industry standards and to the competition. Consider Amazon and Cons Inc., which both have retail operations. In January of 2014, the brilliant Jim Grant noted that both traded at identical multiples of enterprise value to sales but that there was serious cause for concern as it related to Khan's balance sheet, even though sales were up an astounding 32% through November. Citing a colleague, Grant's interest rate observer reported the following. Very simplistically, two things happen at a Khan's store. Merchandise walks out of the building and dollar bills walk in. Short sellers focus more on the rate of growth of dollar bills walking in. The essential bear story is that the rate at which these dollars are walking into cons locations this year is largely unchanged, surging comps and new store openings notwithstanding. So something is wrong with this picture. Essentially, cons is giving people merchandise and telling them they don't have to pay for it just yet. Or they can pay for it slowly. Or the company can restructure their loans, etc. With same store comps rising by double digits and with 10 to 15% more locations this year than last, cash revenues are essentially flat. What's financed the scorching growth is customer receivables. In stark contrast, a Barron's article titled Amazon's Profits Are Soaring, Why That Could Be Bad for the Stock, published in May of 2017, cited the company's ability to sell inventory effectively and quickly, i.e. high inventory turns coupled with the ability to demand terms from vendors as a powerful combination. In some ways, Amazon is like Berkshire Hathaway, but with better returns. Berkshire sells insurance, where premium payments roll in long before claims are paid, allowing CEO Warren Buffett to invest other people's capital free of charge. Amazon sells inventory so quickly 
that it often collects from customers before it pays suppliers, creating an ongoing free float of cash to use. That is the power of working capital. And with these examples in mind, and with an understanding of the impact that working capital strategy can have on a business, let's move on to working capital assumptions. If we take a look at the Excel workbook, in this particular case, we have 10 years of historical financials, starting in 12-31-2011, which means that the working capital data from the company's first few years of operations will be entirely irrelevant to its future. For this reason, in the model, you will see that the first four years have been grayed out to emphasize that this data will not be used to form assumptions about the future of the company. Next, be on the lookout for large fluctuations in working capital accounts. A dramatic increase in accounts receivable, for example, should be an immediate red flag. A higher day sales outstanding or DSO could indicate poor cash management or aggressive revenue recognition. Similarly, any increase in accounts payable should also be explored. If the company is failing to pay vendors in a timely fashion, this may be symptomatic of larger cash management issues and risk stressing critical business relationships. Now, the operating model does not include any wild fluctuations in working capital accounts, but it's important to be aware of the fact that these definitely can exist. By and large, a good way to determine the health of these accounts is to request aging schedules for both accounts receivable and accounts payable. And in any situation where it's difficult to establish a trend, always consider reaching out to the management team for an explanation. Lastly, always be thinking of ways to optimize working capital. Even though it may be a bit early in the process, a good investor should always keep this in mind. As the video titled, How Seasonality Impacts Working Capital and Cash Flow Demonstrates, working capital optimization is a terrific way to increase cash flow. And I actually have a pretty excellent story on this topic. During the global COVID-19 pandemic, which was chaos for so many businesses, a friend of mine that runs a manufacturing company needed a unique solution to increase cash flow and keep raw materials on hand. Now, in the face of unpredictable revenues, he didn't want to risk the cash on his balance sheet to make the upfront payments previously required to secure inventory. So he contacted his largest supplier and requested 360 days to make payment on a significantly larger order on the condition that he would also make payments on all products sold in the interim that were made from that same raw material. This allowed him to match his largest expense with revenue for an entire year. The vendor recognized it as an opportunity to reduce production to one long run, which would have otherwise compared to six shorter runs spaced out over the course of a year. It was really a brilliant move that worked out well for both parties, which is unique because generally when there's a request for an extension of terms, it's just one party choosing to give up ground to the other. When you can make it work for both, that's pretty fantastic. All right, team, that about covers it for working capital. In the next segment, we will be talking about the property plant and equipment schedule. But otherwise, that's all for now. Thanks for watching.